Jerusalem. You can go take your imaginary ghost somewhere else. The Bible says. I know what the Bible says. Well, then what's your problem with it? It's poorly written. so kind would you introduce yourself for the mic sure i'm paul speckman from master death strike funeral bitch abomination grabador blotted out of war cry the list goes on <laughs> how are you i'm good my name is adrian and thank you so much for doing this nice to meet you adrian um, my pleasure and i apologize if you've had to do if you've had, you've had to answer this question twice already yeah, that's but, okay. um, would you mind uh telling me about your beginnings when you got into heavy metal and when you started playing guitar Playing bass. Oh, okay, the beginnings of heavy metal. I was uh, probably, let's say, 14 years old in school, and I was uh, walking down the hall at school. I was a freshman in high school singing a song called All Good People from Yes. And these guys uh, heard me walking down the hall and they, they said, Oh, we got a band, you know, we play cover songs, and would you come and audition? Would you be interested? And so I went down there, went out to their rehearsal studio and sang a few songs from Led Zeppelin and, and uh, Black Sabbath and you know, they had a list of stuff, Tim Lizzy and UFO, you know, and uh, they gave me the job. So we were just doing some shows locally, you know, at, at the high school and at some churches and stuff, playing just heavy metal covers, you know, or whatever, rock, I guess at the time, I wouldn't say heavy metal, but rock covers. Unless you, well, Sabbath was heavy metal, but okay, rock covers. Anyway, and uh, during this time, uh, I kept watching the bass player all the time in the band, this little guy, and I decided I wanted to figure out how to play bass, and I went home and I, uh, I bought a cheap bass, an Epiphone, and I started teaching myself how to play, listening to records and stuff, and you know, Black Sabbath, and uh, probably the first record I was working on was Aerosmith, Draw the Line. I was working on this particular record. And I taught myself how to play. And it took some years, you know. 
I uh, was blowing off school and stuff and sitting home jamming seven hours a day sometimes on the base. My dad used to come home and kick the shit out of me and give me a newspaper after I dropped out of school. Every morning he put the newspaper on my bed. I'd wait for him to go to work and funeral bitch to go to work and the kids to go to school and I'd smoke some bongs and lay back down and get up later in the afternoon and play bass again. So I taught myself how to play bass. It took some years, like I said. You know, I'm still here today, thankfully. Uh, when did you become aware of the heavier and heavier side of the spectrum? I uh, got together. Okay, let me talk about Steve Ehlers. Well, a friend of mine, Steve Ehlers, we were in the Cub Scouts together. And uh, one time I was walking home from a girlfriend that lived near his house, and he was standing in the driveway working on his Volkswagen Beetle. And we started talking, and he said that... Uh, he was uh, teaching himself how to play guitar. And, oh, oh, well, I'm trying to work on bass. Maybe we should get together. So we got together with another friend of his, uh, Marty Fitzgerald, and we started jamming together. And eventually we found a drummer. And again, we were playing cover songs. MSG, Judas Priest, Black Sabbath, The Scorpions. Early stuff like from the 70s Scorpions, you know. And uh, they started introducing me to more heavier, to heavier bands. You know, I discovered Kiss in the basement my brother, older brother in his bedroom, when I was teaching myself bass, I found some records in there. He had Black Sabbath, uh, Bloody Sabbath, and some Kiss records, and I started listening to it. And like I said, then I met this guy, rekindled our friendship, we started jamming, and they turned me on to more heavy metal. We started going to concerts, like uh, 1981, uh, saw Michael Shanker when he was on his uh, first solo tour. Uh, you know, I, as the years go by, I would go and see Venom Exodus and Slayer tour, you know, Motorhead, Merciful Fate, and etc. Just a lot of great shows. I saw Metallica and Slayer, all their first tours, Show No Mercy, etc. Kill Em All, I saw all these tours. And I watched these bands and took in some knowledge from them, you know, watching them and learning and perfecting my craft. This was my introduction to heavy metal. You know? You were based in Chicago at the time? Yeah. Was there a local scene there, like a local trash scene? Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. We had our band War Cry. There was uh, Trouble. There was a, a, one of the guys in the earlier band where I was just singing. He went on to, to join a band called Thrust, which would have some semi, some, some fame and trouble too. And Zetro was there, and you know, and Snow White, and, and it was a great scene at this time because we all hung out and supported each other. There was a camaraderie. Everybody would go to everybody's shows to check out the, the new band or whatever, you know, and, and we learned a lot and hung out together and became really lasting friendships. Some of these guys I know, you know, 30, 40 years later, really, which is great, you know. So, yeah, the scene was thriving in Chicago. I think it was something in the water, maybe. Were <laughs> yeah. you tape trading at the time? Yeah, guys like uh, Bill Steer were sending me their tapes and listening to Master and guys like Chuck from Death were listening to Master and Death Strike and you name it. The guys from Sepultura, the guys from Napalm Death, we were all trading with each other, discovering each other basically. That's the point, yeah? Yeah. Really. It was a great scene then, tape trading. Not like today. Yeah. Well, um, we'll talk about uh, the Napalm and uh, the Parkers guys in a little while. Um, I would like to talk about, you've, you've, you've talked in the past about um, during your time with Warcry, uh, you got more interested in doing heavier music, yeah. and so that's, that's how Death Strike came about. Exactly. Well, actually, the uh, original drummer, Bill Schmidt, he was in Warcry. We played one show together, and he got fired. I, think that, I honestly think today the guitar player made the mistake, but one of the guys made a mistake on the song Black Sabbath, and he threw a stick at the guy. And well, he got thrown out of the band, and we got a different drummer. And uh, well, anyway, and uh, where were we? I lost my train of thought now. Um, that's right. Okay, so what happened was is we got his. He wrote three songs for his band called Master. He wrote uh, Terrorizer, which was the one that influenced the band to name their band Terrorizer, of course. He wrote Master with a friend of his, and he wrote the Pledge of Allegiance. But we never got as far as recording him during that time. In 83, we got as far as taking photos in the graveyard. And actually, the guitar player that was in the graveyard was, he's in my book actually too now, my new book that came out. And uh, he never actually played with the band more than a few rehearsals. And he broke his leg and we split up and that was the end of it. But anyway, uh, so the drummer, he joined a band in Chicago called Mayhem at that time, an up-and-coming band. 
they were playing good stuff and I got pissed off at them and my father just passed away at this time and left me at the house. I had a PA in the basement, my bass amp, etc. and I started writing songs for my own band called Death Strike. Well, later in uh, 84, we recorded the demo in 85 in the spring and later in 85 he begged and pleaded after he heard the demo if he could come back to me and join Death Strike. So we, he joined Death Strike and we changed the band name to Master again. And the band split up again shortly after. We, the original lineup of Master played only two concerts ever in the career, in our career. Because these guys were, were retards. The drummer was on uh, hard drugs all the time, manic depressant. The guitar player was strung out on pussy. I got none against pussy. I like pussy too. But when pussy becomes more important than the music, that's not good. Yeah? And that's what happened to the original members. They never did another thing when I walked away from them. Sorry, guys. Um. Death Strike and Master came out at a time when um, you had a lot of bands like Possessed in the States and over Europe, uh, like Bathory, Hellhammer, stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, how, how aware were you that there was this like more street movement? Were you very tied into it? Or I wasn't aware at all. Okay. We were doing our own thing. Yeah. Didn't know about these other bands. The first time I discovered some of these bands, somebody sent me a cassette in the tape trading thing, and there was a, a live song with Mantis, Chuck's, whatever his first band, Mantis was on there, one live song, Possessed the Exorcist was on this cassette, a rough version of it, and some other bands, and that's really when I, I started to hear there was an outside thing going on, and I, there was a master song on the cassette too, from our demo or whatever, which was cool. But that's when I find it, started finding out there were more bands out there. And obviously, like I said like earlier, we started writing each other, writing letters to each other, sending each other cassettes, and really learning about each other, which was really cool. I wish I had those letters. There was a time in my life where I got angry because I was struggling and nothing was happening with my music, and I burned them all in the backyard at my dad's house. I started a whole thing on fire. I burned all my letters, and it's too bad because they'd be worth something now. Not to sell, but just like to put in a book, you know, take a picture of a letter from Bill Steer. So like Bill Steer contacted me when he uh, uh, when he just quit Napalm Death. He sent me an old Napalm Death patch. I still have it somewhere in, in America. And he said, I'm starting a new band called Carcass. Well, got to watch out for it, you know. It's a long time ago, obviously. And obviously Carcass went on to be huge, but it doesn't matter. I'm happy, you know, I was one of the first guys to ever hear about that band in a, in a private letter at home back in the day. And whatever. Small world, right?
Newer bands were coming out like um, Death, Napalm, um, 
I guess, repulsion to a certain extent. Yeah, were sure. Hearing, were, were you hearing, like, the stuff that you had done with Death Strike and Master? Or, or like, when you when you heard about Terrorizer for the first time, did you think, well, these guys are definitely in I, We knew it right away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we knew it right away. Yeah. And actually, uh, there's, a, there's a guy, Oscar Cabrera, He's still big in the scene. He's a roadie for bands like Suffocation, band uh, Ice T or whatever. He's a he's a big time roadie guitar tech for all the a lot of famous bands, and he's got demos back with bands like Terrorizer and Death and several other bands, Morbid Angel, and they're doing Master and Death Strike covers. Okay, I I don't have the tapes. He does, but he told me years ago, Paul, I got tapes of these guys covering your songs. It's real, but whatever. Okay. And I know people get so upset and excited about it when they hear me say this shit, but it's true, man. Yeah, yeah. I was in one of the first bands right. to do this genre, yeah. and nobody will ever take that away from me. Yeah, yeah. Never. I mean, absolutely. I don't, and I it's think not, no arrogance, it's just yeah. a reality. Yeah. I'm happy that I can still do it today, of course, you know that. Do you feel a sense of pride? Do you feel... Yeah, I feel yeah. like I'm happy that I was part of the inception of the genre. There's nothing wrong with that. People get upset when they hear this stuff, but it's the truth. Hey. You can ask guys from some of these bands. Some of them readily admit it. Some of them don't want to admit it. But it doesn't matter. The truth hurts. But the truth is the truth. Right? Absolutely. Just my opinion. Okay. Let's jump forward to the nuclear blast years. Okay. Uh, is that okay? Do you mind That's a great about story, yeah? Yeah. Um, I, I figured you'd have a lot of stories about that. Because... <laughs> That time period was interesting because at that point, death metal had become largely established. Yeah, and sure. Er Eric were, were doing their thing, World were doing their thing, yeah. and Nuclear Blast was kind of falling apart. Right. Um, but you guys seem to have bad luck with Nuclear Blast. Is that fair? Maybe bad luck's not the right way to do it. No, no, I wouldn't say bad luck. Let's just start how it began. Uh, I was uh, moving furniture in Chicago. And uh, I went to the forest preserve to drink some beers after work. And this character, a famous guy on the scene, Joe Caper, a friend of mine back in the day, he was at the forest on his Harley Davidson with a friend of mine from high school. And he said, uh, my band, uh, Righteous Pigs, just signed to this new label called Nuclear Blast. He said, Paul, you know, I hadn't seen the guy in five years, maybe. He said, Paul, you know, uh, maybe they'd be interested in you. Well, luck would have it for me. I had the Red Abomination demo, a copy, in my pocket, and I gave it to him. And he and Marcus and uh, Slatko, who, rest in peace, he died, one of the original Nuclear Blast guys, Slatko and Mitch Harris discussed this, and within, whatever, two weeks, I had an Abomination deal. A week later, Master, a few months later, Death Strike. We recorded seven albums, we did several tours, everything was fantastic, and then it all fell apart. They dropped the ball on a uh, collection of souls. They didn't like the direction because we didn't go to Morris Sound and trigger the drums like we did on the seventh day and use all these effects. We, I wanted to go for a more dry, earlier sound and they didn't like it and we split up. It wasn't a bad thing, it established my career. I still thank them today. I wouldn't be here today without Nuclear Blast. They're the ones that got my music to the masses in a bigger, bigger way, you know. The very first time I heard Master was on a one of the Death is Just Beginning uh, compilations. Yeah, the first one and the second one. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So they were helpful. Yeah. You said it yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, they owed me money for eons and stuff, and three years ago, they paid me a lot of money. Okay. They paid me back royalties for my catalog. A lot of money. Let's just leave it that. Okay. Glad yeah. to hear it. Um, but there was an issue with uh, them not being happy with the first master album, right? They didn't like the, uh, the production? Yeah, the original recording was done at Solid Sound, and they decided they wanted to remix it. And so what they did is they remixed it at Morris Sound. They triggered the bass drums, and they triggered the snare. And whatever, they did a good job. I, I don't want to say that. I just thought the original recording was better because it was more raw. And unfortunately, uh, I didn't get the original one out until 93 on Displeased, and I'm glad I did because, you know, Scott Burns, uh, when he when he triggered the drums and remixed the master, he forgot several guitar solos and lots of things. And so, luckily in 93, I had a chance to let the people hear the original recordings, and I think the original recordings were much heavier, personally. And many people think it when they hear it, they're like, wow. You know, Nuclear Blast, they were just, uh, you know, starting to grow a bit and they wanted to go the 
horror sound route because it was catchy and everyone was doing it. They kind of wanted to be copycats, and that's kind of lame if you think about it. You know, but the record, uh, the for, the second master, it sold 50,000 units, so can't say that it wasn't wasn't good, but just. You know, I really didn't want to go to Morrison, but they wanted us to go there and do an album, and we did. We did the Speckman Project as well, you know, and that's a good record too. You know, I don't want to say they're horrible. Just I like the original recordings, and I would have preferred to to done uh, the second master without triggers. But okay, that was the last record I ever did with triggers. We don't use triggers. It's like a typewriter, and every band sounds the same. And if you listen to the latest master records in the last five years, they still sound original. They don't sound like anyone else. And that's why we're still touring. I know that. You know? I mean, nobody's selling records like they used to, me either, but I'm still selling them regardless and still touring every year. You know? I mean, the problem with a lot of these bands that go with that, that very triggered, very processed sound is, you know, they have to pull that off live as well. And if they can't pull it off live. Many of them can't pull it off live. It's disgusting sometimes. You hear the bass drums triggered and and the foot's off for some reason, and you hear it. And it's embarrassing to me, yo. The guys in my bands, the drummers, they don't use triggers live. Unless there's no PA or something, and that's rare. Maybe once a year, I might be forced to listen to it, but it's not very often, you know? Because they have no drum mics or whatever. It's a small club or, you know, it happened maybe once this year. Belgium, tiny club, you know, it doesn't matter, but not very often, you know, I mean, my guy could pull it off, but we don't trigger the drums in the first place, so he didn't have to worry about that, you know. I'd like to talk about when you moved to the Czech Republic. Okay. That was about 99, is that correct? Oh, actually, I moved there in 2000, but I, I was there for a while in 99 to record a project. It was called Martyr, Murder X, The End of the Game, with uh, the drummer and the bass, or, sorry, the guitar player from Kravathor. Okay. And then after this uh, recording, their bass player quit the band, Kravathor, and they offered me the position on bass. And I just felt at that time that, hey, any musician who wants to, wants to go out and play, especially since not a lot was going on in America at that time for me, it was a little bit dull. And they offered me this, this job, and I said, hey, I'm coming. I sold all my shit. Six weeks later, I moved to the Czech Republic, and this is 15 years or so ago now. You know? I found happiness there, of course. You know, The first tour with Krabator was in Japan. I mean, come on. It was a good beginning. So like for the first three or four years in Czech Republic, I would tour all summer, mainly Europe, sometimes Mexico, sometimes the U.S., but mainly Europe. And then I would move furniture in the winter in Phoenix for three or four months, send money to my girlfriend to pay for our flat, and then go back, back and forth. I did that for three or four years. And one day I just decided to stay forever, and I've been there whatever, 11 years afterwards. What is it about the Czech Republic that clicked with you? Freedom. <laughs> no police. You know, like for example, on our way uh, from Florida here, I saw at least 100 people pulled over on the highway. When you travel through Europe, you're lucky if you see one or two police with a truck pulled over across the whole country of Czech and Germany. There's not so much control over the people. There's still freedom there. America's a police state, and I really don't like it. You know, I, I live in a small village, and I'm surrounded by old people and vineyards, and and there's chickens and ducks and things, and I live a really slow life out there, and it's wonderful. It's quiet, you know, believe me. Okay, I come to America to make some money every year. That's true. Whatever, and then I go home. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when I when I was growing up in the 70s, America was a lot freer. Let's put it that way. Or maybe I just didn't notice it. I think it was freer. Yeah. I think there was definitely a change. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously 9/11 or whatever fucked everything up. Unfortunately for for the whole world, it's too bad. You know.
did living overseas for an extended period of time change your perception of the United States when you come back? Like, yeah, you because, you yeah, because you're standing on the outside looking in. Standing on the outside taking a shit. But yeah, anyway, uh, yeah, it's a <laughs> discharge song, I think. Anyway, it doesn't matter. But yeah, you uh, it's a different perception when you're on the outside looking in, you know. You know, I, I know so many people that have never left the U.S. They don't know what freedom is anymore. They don't know. They're happy here. But a lot of my friends uh, that I grew up with and stuff, they never left their own backyards. They're still living with their parents. I've gone and seen the world everywhere. And I found a, a haven for me in the Czech Republic. You, know? you mentioned discharge just a little while ago. Uh, one thing that you've been very consistent about is uh, talking about how bands like Discharge, GBH, MDC were big influences on you. Motorhead, yeah. Minor Threat, yeah. Venom, come on, yeah. of course. Did you see... Uh, Especially when you're developing Death Strike and Master, did you see a big distinction between like what the hardcore punk guys were doing and what the thrash guys were doing? No, did you see it was similar. There were similarities, and luckily for me, uh, some friends of mine, some women, some girls, whatever. They, uh, the one girl had a mohawk. She was a punk rocker, and I started riding with her and her friends to all these punk shows, and it, you know I got to see. Uh, the UK subs and they exploited in these small tiny clubs with 150 people dying it's fucking you know 100 degrees in that room but I watched it and stuff and you know you had all these punk rockers and mohawks etc and you'd have like maybe 20 or 25 long haired guys and, and they weren't beating us up or nothing they were, they were cool you know we were getting along already so then you know when Motorhead started getting bigger you saw that the punks were going to Motorhead the metalheads and this was the same way when I went to see you know Discharge or whatever, or GBH or the Exploited, the UK subs, whatever. These other, all these other bands. I saw a lot of these bands at that time that I'm talking about, yo. Know? And I enjoyed it. And, and that's what I'm trying to say is that the, the punk rockers and the metalheads, we got along because we felt the energy together. We weren't boxing each other. We got along, and we still get along today, man. I can go to a punk show with a bunch of punk rockers anywhere in the world. They're not gonna start beating me up. They're fucking into the energy, man. I like that. In Germany, though, I I go to punk shows sometimes with my friends, you know, and we're getting along, man, you know that, believe me, yeah, okay, good. <laughs> I guess at this point it's been over two decades since uh, since uh, the first Master Devils, right? Yeah, um, 1985. Yeah, two decades. Yeah, I'm old. <laughs> Three decades. Three, 80? yeah, 30 uh, years, yeah, I'm old. <laughs> Okay. Um, yeah, that's why it's looking at me funny. Two decades, three. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no problem. It's okay, brother. Who, who is the master audience now? Like, do you still see guys from the old days? Is it yeah, mostly? that's what's strange. It's like, for example, when we play Chicago this weekend, there'll be 50 guys from the back in the day, and actually, new young kids too that just discovering a master. Thankfully, that it like continues. You know? Yeah, it's strange that you see friends all over the world, man. You know. Sometimes from 24, they don't go to every show, but every few years you'll see a guy that was at the show 25 years ago, and you're like, what the fuck? And they're like, Man, and you, they got a shirt on from 1990 or whatever, and you're just, you're in shock, you know? Of course. It's nice to see. They're like, oh yeah, Paul, you know, I've been following you for a fucking long time, but I had to come out tonight. You're, you're happy to see him. Nice to see you again. Nice shirt. Oh, yeah, it's from 1990. You're an old bastard. Me too. <laughs> you know, it's nice that people still support you. You, know? you see freaks of all ages. I like it. That's why I still do it. Yeah, you know? I still enjoy it. That's excellent. Um, we we went through an interesting phase. Um, there was a big kind of nostalgia old school movement. I'm, I'm sure you noticed it. A lot of bands. You know, kind of paying tribute to like the early days of death early days of master yeah. to the point of like recording um, <laughs> recording the way like master's old demo stuff uh, yeah, so, sure yeah. Yeah, yeah. what was your reaction when you, when you heard that kind of stuff maybe you just heard about that, that stuff oh well you know I thought it was interesting I really couldn't understand why they were covering me like for example, and Napalm Death covered a song or whatever. I was, you know, surprised, happy. They gave me a lot of money for it, actually. 
And actually, just to mention it now, uh, speaking of cover songs, uh, Asphix is covering the song Master this year on their new album. They just informed me. For free. I told them it's for free. They're friends, yo. Martin Van Juren is a good friend, yo. I told them it's for free, man. But I was a little surprised. I didn't realize that it was so so influential. Some of these bands got a lot bigger, and then I find out they're covering my songs or talking about me. Because you don't know everybody. I didn't know every band. Like when we toured with Benediction, I don't know, 15 years ago, we put the uh, Master logo up and the Benediction up, and and I remember uh, Daz, the guitar player, was like, Paul, yeah, you know, we, we kind of stole your logo. <laughs> you know, I, at, at that time, I didn't know about Benediction. He's like, yeah, we kind of stole your logo. Oh, and by the way, when we had Barney Greenway in the band, he said, you know, the first year, we played your song Terrorizer as the opener for all the shows the first year. Oh, I didn't know that. Well, I was flattered. That's the word. Why wouldn't I be? Made me happy. Oh, whatever, you guys. Cool. We had a great tour of Benediction. It doesn't matter. But it just shows you how small the world is sometimes. You're just like, oh, I didn't know that. Okay. I'd say you're uh, you're refreshingly humble about uh, like like your influence on like this entire South. I mean, I, like uh, I grew up on like Napalm and Carcass and uh, great yeah, bands, stuff like of that. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, I, I feel like a lot of those bands wouldn't have existed now. Like what you were doing, what Celtic Frost was doing. Uh, it's quite possible, let's say, but it doesn't matter, yo. I respect them, and they respect me, and I know that. You know, some of the guys from time to time still talk about me, which is still okay. It's not paying the bills, but it doesn't matter. It's nice to be remembered, yeah. I just met Matt from Repulsion last year at Brutal Assault. And he's like, Paul, uh, I've never met you before. Yeah, how you doing, man? We were hanging out with Benediction and happened to be drunk, all of us drunk. And, and he's like, oh, I just want to tell you something. You were first. What's the matter, dude? Drink your beer. <laughs> yeah, doesn't matter, though. I didn't know that. I didn't know a lot about his band. A lot of people all influenced by Repulsion and basically told me right there. He said you were a big influence on us. I'm like, hey, okay, whatever, cool, dude. You know, doesn't matter. Made me feel good. I smiled. I respect the guy, of course. You know? You don't have to be an asshole about it, you know? You know what I mean? I know you can be, but I'm not going to be an asshole about it. I'm happy. Nice. Nice that there's cool people on the scene. Let's talk about the book in a little while. But first sure. I want to ask you about uh, uh, Johansson and Spectre. Sure, what about it? Was the first time you got in touch with Roga Johansson with, uh, for the, the Mega Scavenger album? Yeah, he got a hold of me. Okay. He said, Paul, I wrote a song for you. It's in the master vein. You don't know me. And I was like, it's true, I don't know you. He said, would you be interested in checking it out? And the song was great. So a year later when he wrote me and said, Paul, I wrote a whole album. He said, just for you and me, would you be interested in doing it? I wrote him back right away. I loved the first song, it was great. I said, send me a few tracks. He sent me a few tracks. He wrote some lyrics for some of the songs and and uh, finally we agreed on doing it. He would pay for my studio time and give me a little bit of money, really small amount, a couple hundred euros for the studio and for doing it, really peanuts. But I liked the music so much, I was into it. I said, hey, let's do it, you know? I like working, so that's why I do a lot of different records and projects and stuff. It's not about money. It's about having a good time and trying different things with different people. I like this. And so what he did is he uh, sent me the lyrics, I think, to maybe six songs. And it was like 10 or 11 songs. And and uh, he didn't, like, none of the lyrics went to a particular song. I had to pick the song to put those lyrics in and rearrange it and add some more lyrics and correct it and change the word, fix his words or whatever. And then uh, I did the last four songs myself and I would go in the studio in the afternoon or sometimes in the morning, record two songs, send it to him. Well, he liked it right away. And then I said, well, what are we going to do about the last four songs? you got no lyrics. You write them. So then this, this next album, same thing, except uh, I wrote more than he did on this album, the vocals. But the newer album is even better. But I'm just saying that it's, it was a great collaboration. We're going to do another one next year, of course, because we like each other. It's really easy to do. That's okay. He's a good, good guitar player. I like him. You know? We met each other like maybe once in our lives. I met him somewhere 10 years ago. Uh, so uh, the third album came out. Uh, couple, second one. Second one. Yeah. Came out a couple months ago. Yeah. And you guys are planning on a third one uh, maybe next year. Yeah, for next year. Yeah, I got to do the new master record in August, so 
step by step. I like to kind of keep them separated. Then I have that other band too, Cadaveric Poison. We're doing a full album as well at the end of this year. That stuff's great too. Completely different writer. It doesn't sound anything like Master, this one. It's, it's really cool. You've got to check it out, Cadaveric Poison. There's just a seven inch out. And even Nuclear Blast likes Cadaveric Poison, so. Maybe we sign a deal with them next year. I don't know. <laughs> you never know, yeah? Funny. Uh, t tell me about this upcoming Master album. Have you guys finished writing it? Well, I've written 25 songs, and I have no lyrics yet. I don't do the lyrics until I'm done with the, putting the music together. I I've written 25 tracks, and we need to sit down when I get home from this tour for maybe two months and pick out our favorite 11 songs, and then I'll, I'll start writing the lyrics. Yeah. I can't really tell you anything else about it, you know. It's 25 new songs, you know. And there's some really great ones, and it's, I'm sure, you know. I trust you. You know. <laughs> um, is it also going to come out on FDA? Yeah. They're doing a great job. They did a great job in the album. They support us. They pay for the records. I'm still making money. Okay, not what I was making 20 years ago, but so what? A good chunk of change every year, every time, whatever. I've heard that you you were writing a book, I guess, uh, a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, an autobiography, but that's not what this book is. Okay, so this book is uh, a pictorial of my life. It's a coffee table book. It's a big one. It's done in uh, imitation alligator skin. It looks fantastic. Famous artist friend of mine from across the con from Holland did the cover, and uh, it's got some stories, maybe 20 pages of stories. It's mostly a pictorial book, spanning my whole career, never before seen photos. It's really cool. The real autobiography has yet to come out, maybe someday. And when it does, it's going to crush a lot of people's perceptions of metal. Because there's a lot of assholes in the business that I talk about and tell the truth about. You know? Has to be done. Yeah. yeah, so I gotta set the record straight before I die. Yeah. Uh, is is Brazilian Points uh, putting out the coffee table? No, no, it's a German company called uh, Weiss's Light White Lights. The book's already out. It's, it's been out for a couple months. Yeah, it's selling, of course. Could be selling more because you can't find it on Amazon.com. Only Amazon.de, which makes no sense to me. Ah, uh, so it's only available uh, through the European. Yeah, and through me, and that's a problem. You know, the book would be selling faster if more people knew it existed. Yeah. Are you, are, do you have any copies uh, with you on tour? No, of course not. You can't bring the books from Europe. I had to bring other stuff. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, so, we're finishing up. Uh, what do you have planned for the next? You mentioned the new Master album. You mentioned uh, that with Poison. Um, when does this tour end for you? This tour ends, uh, it's only a few weeks. It's 16 days. The last show is Maryland Death Fest. Okay. So on Friday. And then uh, go home. We have festivals throughout the summer. Another European tour in October. South America again in January. Next year, USA again. Another European tour. I keep going all the time, dude. Believe me. I'm into it still, yo. Yeah. Um, speaking of tours, um, so I'm actually based in Southeast Asia. And right now, my friends are will be listening to this podcast and hating me because uh, I'm seeing Master and they're not. Can we expect Master in Malaysia or Singapore anytime? Yeah, when somebody can, can pay for the flights and get us over there. I'm not asking for enormous fees. Yeah. Just a reasonable amount of, reasonable amount of money to pay the guys and pay for the flights as well. Yeah, I've never been to Asia except with Kravator. Only once. But yeah, we'd love to go over there. If somebody can hook it up, it'd be great. I don't want to go over there for one show in each country, though. We need a few weeks. It's a long way. You know, I've been trying to contact Japan and trying to contact China. I'd like to do this whole area, but obviously somebody has to get the ball rolling contact everybody and get a couple weeks together I'd love to go there obviously you need visas everywhere it's a lot of paperwork but it can be done if somebody who knows how to do it can do it right. yeah I, I think the way that um, they usually do it at least through, through South, Southeast Asia is if a band has um, a tour schedule for Australia well that's my point yeah. we don't know anybody there either that's a problem all these American bands are traveling there all the time and I've never been offered a, a deal there okay. never been offered a chance to go I know we have fans over there in Asia I'm not an idiot yeah. 
but somebody has to get us over there one day. But I never give up because, you know, we had never been in South America until 2010, once in 98, but it was a long, you know, long time coming, 12 years later. But we came back and now we're going every year. So you just have to find somebody. We'll or they have to find me, you know, whatever. Okay, so make it happen. Not okay, right all right. Uh, anything you want to add? Sure. Yeah, thanks for the fucking interview, man. Thank Some you, really uh, thought-provoking questions, which is important, you know? You get a lot of interviews where they're stupid. So I'm glad you asked me some good questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we want to go to Asia. <laughs>
days And here comes up the chosen Who will be saved The sorrow and the suffering Of the weak Tomorrow will be long Till the new elite For years I know The people as the slave And reared him softly Forget the steeple, rethinking is nearly